Hello lovelies, I'm terrible at pimping my stuff, so here I am, pimping my stuff. Please like, subscribe, and most important of all, share, so that people can discover me and all the wonders that I offer. Hello lovelies, I have a backlog of things to review, so you're going to be getting reviews for a while, and maybe two videos a day for a while, and I have gotten at least one other person involved in game design and so on to do uh, some of the Roll for Insight videos, so you can look forward to that uh, after my next spate of them has come out. But yeah, today we're looking at Scarlet Heroes. This is a game I've been playing on every other Sunday on T-Shirted Historian's channel. Go and subscribe, help get the guy to a thousand so you can monetize that shit. Uh, and I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, it's an interesting game. It's OSR, but the timing gives me an opportunity to compare and contrast Scarlet Heroes with Shadow Dark. Right? So this is the kind of analogy that I've come up with. So Shadow Dark is very commercial it's not actually produced by a big studio or anything but what constitutes shadow dark is familiar pre-packaged elements so it's like you know you buy the individual zords from power rangers yeah and then you put them together to make the mega zord but each individual zord yeah, it's a commercial product. It works in a certain way. It fits together in a certain way. And you end up with a certain ending point. That's Shadow Dark. Scarlet Heroes, other OSR games, Lamentation of the Flame Princess, ones like that, they're more like Lego. So you're building your own Zords and then putting those together to create a Mega Zord. You end up with something that kind of looks similar but the way in which it's been put together, the amount in which the designer has expressed themselves through the through the mechanics and the setting and all the rest of it is is very different. Um, you get a much more holistic, characterful, individualistic vision from more traditional OSR products. Right? It's it's beyond house ruling in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, they all go back to the same pool from which to start. You know, typically early D and D, first edition AD and D, Beck me, that that kind of thing. But they then build forward and atop on that, taking new and interesting paths, doing innovative things. And Scarlet Heroes is is no different. Whereas Shadow Dark, and I'm not dissing it, it's just a, it's a different approach, it's a different market in a, a lot of ways. It's much more commercial, it's much more familiar. It doesn't really step out of bounds and do anything new or innovative with anything. Uh, it's just um, it's a slickly packaged thing that hit the market at the right time. Whereas the OSR is like, yeah, Lego or homebrewed beer, right? Made by enthusiasts uh, for smaller audiences and as such can afford to be more innovative, risk takey and all that kind of stuff, which is a, a, a valid thing to be, I think. Um, some people diss the OSR and say it's like taking away from D&D &D or people should be putting their efforts into 5e. There's room for everybody, <laughs> really. And the OSR is doing things that are more interesting, uh, certainly from the, the the viewpoint of a game designer or a seasoned player. Anyway, this is Scarlet Heroes, which, as I say, I've been playing every other Sunday and enjoying. It has an Asiatic flavour to it, but not quite your typical kind of pseudo-mythic China or pseudo-mythic Japan. This is much more rooted in Southeast Asian culture. So basically everything between India and Australia <laughs> is kind of what we're talking about, all those islands and so on. Some of them have more Indian influence. Some of them have more traditionally Asian influence. 
some of them are very much their own thing. And this is a very underserved part of the world as far as role-playing games are concerned. So it's, it's nice to see something drawing on a very rich history and culture and um, monsters that you might not necessarily be so aware of from the, the traditions and the mythology of those areas. I don't know why it gets passed over too much. Maybe it's too exotic, too unfamiliar. Maybe China is more relatable from wuxia movies. Maybe Japan is more familiar from endless ninja and samurai films and so on. And we don't see a lot coming out of Malaysia or Indonesia or wherever else. So we're not as familiar. And so maybe it's outside that sweet spot. But I, I still think that's disappointing. <laughs> Um, I still think that's kind of kind of upsetting because it's a nice area for this kind of stuff. Um, I think we can also all point to another reason why there might not be much gaming material based in that area, and that is that if you write about a culture that isn't yours, however studied you are, um, you're probably going to get in trouble with somebody. And... I doubt there's a huge audience for RPGs in Southeast Asia. Big potential audience, perhaps, but um, not much of an existing audience, which means less designers as well. It's a, it's a shame. Um, but yeah, this at least redresses the balance somewhat. In the stream game, I play a, uh, a con artist who masquerades as being a monk, uh, with his begging bowl going from town to town, you know, um, getting getting money from suckers, who is gradually turning into a hero and a demon hunter because he comes from humble origins and he sees the, the problems that people are having. And I feel that that gets reflected in the rules and in the character sheet in Scarlet Heroes in a way that it doesn't necessarily in other OSR games. Um, this, this is a game by Kevin Crawford, who's something of a name uh, in in this kind of field, I suppose. Uh, he's a big hero of t-shirts. Again, go and go and subscribe to T-shirt Historian's channel. Watch the Weekend Geek on Saturday and games every other Sunday. But he really rates Kevin Crawford, and I can see why. Looking through this, even though I'm not really an OSR guy, um, I can see the appeal here. The kind of heroes you create in this are Robert E. Howard type heroes. Tough, but not invulnerable. Um, part of the reason for that, I think, is that this is also designed for single player uh, playing of campaigns, which is something I, I, I do not grok with fullness. Um, to me, it's the interplay of ideas and the negotiation and bargaining that goes on at the table and the interpretation of the dice rolls between two people that makes it appealing. If I'm making all the decisions, I'll run a game or I'll, or I'll write a novel, but it seems to be more popular than ever lately, so it's, it's worth examining it from this. There are typical races. There are... Well, there's one different uh, called the Shu show they are all the goblinoids all the kind of intelligent monsters mixed together so you can play human elf but elves are a bit different dwarf but dwarves are a bit different halfling but halflings are a bit different or a half shoe show whichever it is um and that's kind of whatever you want it to be really you could be a beast man or a partial mutant or a half orc or a half goblin or whatever it is you want it doesn't really make a difference when it comes to your stats, but it might give you access to particular traits. But then, if you're playing anything other than human, it makes you less adaptable. But there's nothing game-breaking here, there's nothing that really screws up the balance, and there's no reason you can't play a human who has picked up some of the traits from the other races through magic or, or whatever else. Traits are really interesting. They work kind of like careers in Barbarians of Lemuria, um, in that it's a kind of semi-broad category of stuff you can do that operates like a skill, but over several different situations, right? Um, and it ranges from 
plus one, well, from nothing at all to, to plus three. And then you apply that bonus when you're making a skill type roll. So stat bonus, skill bonus. I think multiples, multiple traits can apply. Offhand, I can't remember exactly. But anyway, so you roll d20, you, uh, sorry, 2d8. That's one other big change. Uh, for certain checks, you roll 2d8 and add your stat bonus and your and your trait bonus. So that gives you a more reliable bell curve for when you're testing that that kind of thing. The things that you should be okay at, you can reliably get an average sort of roll in, which is nice. Whereas in combat and so on, you're still rolling a d20, which gives you a flat probability with lots of swings back and forth, which uh, is an interesting idea and one I've been toying with, damn you, Kevin Crawford, of changing the way something is resolved while using the same rules <laughs> to represent the, the different kind of situation, the intensity and semi-randomness of combat. So it was nice to see that practiced, though 2d8 doesn't feel quite right. Maybe maybe 2d10? I don't, I don't know. Um, the other big innovation, I think, is the fray dice. Now, this basically ensures that you're never entirely helpless uh, and you never feel completely useless during a fight or whatever. Different classes have different fray dice, from um, d6 for a cleric to d4 for a mage. That's basically a free action you can use typically to to attack, almost always to attack, but I think uh, a, a canny GM can interpret it more broadly. The lets you just do something extra. So I attack with my quarterstaff and miss, but for my fray dice, I kick out at one of the goblins. I get a three. That's enough for one damage. That's another thing that's changed. That's enough to take a goblin out of the fight, right? So maybe I, I punt him in the groin and knock him off the side of a mountain or something, right? So each character type has a fray dice. You can use that against beings with hit dice of less than or equal to your level, except for a mage, which even though they only get a d4, it represents little bits of magic or, or whatever that you can fling around, and you can do that to anybody, which helps make mages more viable at lower levels without overpowering them as they get to higher levels because it stays at, at a d4. Um, so that's that's interesting. The rolls to hit are done against a static number of 20. So you roll. Um, the higher your armor number, the worse your armor is. So you add that on top, and then you'd add your, your combat skill bonus. You're trying to get over 20 to hit. Pretty, pretty simple. When you hit, you roll damage according to the weapon. So let's say you know, uh, some kind of great weapon. Right. If you roll a 1 on whatever dice you're rolling, it doesn't do any damage. And then the higher you roll, the more damage you do. So you might do 1 hit dice of damage, 2 hit dice of damage, 3, 4 hit dice of damage. And that determines how many hit dice. You don't use hit points, so you convert hit dice to hit points for creatures. You still have hit points, which are higher, which make you more survivable. But that way you can kind of plough through quite large numbers of enemies <laughs> relatively rapidly. Um, in a way that's quite heroic, but things can turn on you just uh, just as quickly. So, you're, like I said, you're, you're tough but not invulnerable. Careers-wise, you've got your typical cleric, magic user, fighter, rogue. It does feel like monk ought to be in here, uh, as in, hurrah, monk, but it isn't. But conversions aren't difficult, and there are various OSR versions of a monk that you could convert easily enough. Um, there's compressed XP and basically you get XP for each adventure you participate in and it slowly increases in the number that you need to go up a level. Levels typically run to 10 rather than higher, you don't really need any more. I don't think, you, you feel basically competent or even heroically competent at lower levels and it doesn't change that much as you go up, you just kind of get access to more options. So it's quite a good beginner's RPG, I think. Um, some preconceptions from other OSR games or older versions of D&D will carry through easily enough. Some things from modern D&D will carry through. But there's enough that's different and innovative and effective 
um, that it really works. It's just neat. Um, it's like a, like a Swiss watch. It all kind of locks together nicely, but it's not overly complicated. It, it just works, <laughs> I guess. Um, the single player thing, I did give it a go. I don't understand the appeal. It just doesn't really work for me. Um, I made a, a cleric character for, for the single player who was just migrating from his monastery in the mountains down to the nearest city. Uh, I got taken out about halfway through by a band of orcs, but since they were fleeing from an enemy and I'd already killed all but one of them, I ruled that they moved on to continue fleeing the enemy, which didn't find me just because I wanted to move to do the whole thing through to through to completion. Um, that's the problem with games mastering for yourself, I think. <laughs> you tend to be too lenient, um, and it's I'm not used to it. It's a new idea to me, this single player stuff outside of game books. Um, and it's it just it just doesn't really work for me. It's not a not a satisfying experience. Um one last innovative mechanic is called Defy Death. So if you would otherwise die or be put in an unwinnable situation, you can take a number of dice equal to your level, roll them as damage, take that much damage from your character, and then you either shrug off the poison, get out of the situation in some way, luck intervenes in some way, but you are hurt or reduced in power. Um... That's quite nice. It gets rid of some of the capriciousness of a lot of old school mechanics that will just kill you outright, but replaces it with something that is still going to be damaging and difficult and treats you as a hero so slightly differently to NPCs. The magic in it is all very familiar, but it's been given um, different names, uh, much more evocative names of the, of the culture and place, like Six Small Thunders instead of Magic Missile. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, it's still the same kind of familiar magic for the most part, but I don't know. The the names are a nice flavorful thing to, to add in. The bestiary is very Asiatic and, again, very Southeast Asia for the most part, um, which kind of brings me back around to the, the setting. Oh, you do have rules for treasure hoard generation so on encounters all of that it's all in here it's a very complete rpg given the given the size that it is but yeah the, the the asiatic thing it's what attracted me to the game uh when it was proposed and when i read it i love the aesthetic i love the monsters and i love the parts of the game that have that asiatic influence but i feel that that vision is compromised by leaning into a lot of the standard and familiar fantasy tropes right so you've got your halfling you've got your dwarf you've got your elf they're a bit different but they're still there you've got the usual classes monk is conspicuous by its absence but then you've also got the sort of standard fantasy cultures as well kind of superimposed on this place so if you want to play a more medieval style knight or a traditional dwarf from under the mountain and so on, you can, which you know opens up to a bigger audience, I suppose. But it just feels like a, a lack of cohesion of vision, which is such a shame given the rest of the book, which is otherwise so good. So what do I think really in, in the final analysis of the game? It is a, a neat little thing. It's a good filler game that can be played with a reduced number of players. So if a couple of people beg off game night, there's that. Um, if you're into your single player games, and again, I'm not, but I'm not, I'm not <laughs> kink shaming you for uh, playing with yourself. It seems to kind of work. Um, it's not something I'm used to or something I like, but it, it seems to work and other people have said good things about it. I love the Southeast Asian influence. I think it could have gone further with that. If you want to run a slightly more heroic sword and sorcery game, you could probably derive what you need 
from this. The trait system would be very easy to adopt and put into other games um, as an alternative to other skill systems and uh, I like it quite a lot. Um, it's simple, uncomplicated, it's got some new ideas which are very well executed, it uh, covers a culture and mythology that is desperately underserved in the market. I, I like it a lot. Um, style. So you have to judge each game within its context, right? And this is a small independent studio, print on demand. I am well aware of all the issues of funding and print quality and everything else that you that you face working in, in print on demand. So you have to put it within that context. In that context, it is pretty well presented. I'd actually say the cover art is some of the worst art in the book, unfortunately. Um, it just doesn't quite look right, but it does evoke the setting. I mean, it's, it's black and white, it's pretty basic, but that's clear for giving out the information. Some of the things could have used with having a bit more room to breathe or a few more illustrations, but like I say, I understand the 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 nature of the the nature of the game publishing this stuff. So in terms of style, I'm gonna give it an average of three, but given the type of content and the underserved mythology that it is presenting in an easily consumable form, and given the stylistic nature of the system, I'm gonna raise that average three to a four. In terms of substance, there is everything here that you need but not necessarily everything that you want. So I'm going to... I mean, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Um, and it leaves you wanting a bit more, which is fine. Um, but I'm only going to give it an average content because it's just, it's just... It's bare bones in a lot of ways. So four for style, three for substance, seven out of ten, three and a half out of five. That's above average. Now, my scores genuinely run <laughs> 1 to 10, right? 5 being average uh, out of 10. So 7 is, is pretty good, actually. Um, and it's not a big book. It's not expensive. I would say it's worth, it's worth picking up. If you're an OSR player, if you're an OSR designer or home brewer, there's a, a lot of ideas and things in here that you can put to good use. And it might inspire you to look into Southeast Asian mythology. And I hope it does. Zhang. Go back to where it all started for Postmortem Studios in 2004. Cloak of Steel, remade in French as Mantel d'Acier, created back when Postmortem Studios was trying to be a workers' cooperative. A magipunk fantasy setting of fortress cities and magical mecha, an OGL game with flexible magic and a well-developed world. One day, it'll get a new edition. Until then, you can get it at post-mort.com, drive-thru-rpg, and lulu.com.